It's good to have you with us this morning as we join together to worship the Lord as, uh, as the body of Christ. We want to greet the people in the gym as well, and uh, thank you for coming. Would you please stand as we begin to worship the Lord this morning? But it couldn't fail me A man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough Then you came along And put me back together And every desire now satisfied here in your love oh there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing nothing is better than you I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me prayer, because the God of the mountain is the God. There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better. Yeah. 
Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever bring We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Seventeen through 19. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, not to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Above all
singing. Thank you so much. Children, we will dismiss you now to Children's Church. If I could have all the kids line up on the side here and the rest of you may be seated. All right. Well, good morning. How are you guys doing? Good, good. Well, hey, man, it, tell you what, it is a, a pleasure to worship here at Pleasant View Bible Church with you guys. And I was just thinking about it th just this morning, like, Wow, what an amazing privilege it is, right, and the freedoms that we have, so never take uh, that for granted. So we just want to welcome you guys here today uh, to Pleasant View Bible Church, and uh, one interesting thing that you might have found in your seats, whether you're here in the main auditorium or you're in the gym uh, or you're in the branch, you might have seen these cards uh, on the chairs uh, when you were sitting down, and I don't know if you're like me, uh, sometimes, honestly, if I'm honest with you, I, when I'm out in the community and I'm uh, maybe I'm getting groceries or uh, just going to the, the haircut place. Uh, sometimes it's hard, uh, actually, to ask people to come to church, right? It's sometimes uh, it, it's hard to, to make that invite. Uh, you, you know that the Spirit is prompting you to say, hey, invite them to church. Tell them about Jesus. And so we just wanted to make it a little bit simpler for us uh, here at Pleasant View Bible Church. When, when you're out in the community, we, we created these cards. Uh, we're calling them invite cards, and, and they're real simple, right? It's an invitation for you to let someone know that you belong here. You belong here where we're focused on Christ and, and focused on God's work in and through our lives, where we are worshiping together, where we're growing together, and where we're serving together. So maybe you're like me. Take a few cards, keep them with you as you are in the community, and, uh, and, and make those invites personal. Make those invites uh, uh, vocal and not just like handing out the cards or anything, but have a conversation and say, hey, we would love to hear more of your story, hear more of your journey uh, at Pleasant View Bible Church. So these cards are to help us out with that. So take some invite cards today. And in fact, some of us here, uh, especially on staff, have been a little eager uh, with those invite cards already in the community. So you may have gotten one of these and you're here today. And today might be your first time then. Or it might be your second time or maybe your fifth time here. Well, we would love to get to know you and get to know more of your journey. So I would like to personally invite you to the Connect table, which is out in our main foyer here. Uh, we would love to get, uh, get to know you and hear more of your story. And so fill out one of our Connect cards there at the table and get one of these amazing mugs, right? Uh, one of these amazing mugs you can put some coffee in or you can put some water in and uh, have a great time uh, with the mug that we have. It's really fun. I, I use them all the time. It's fantastic. And one uh, last note uh, before we move into our pastoral prayer is you may have noticed another thing is we've added a few chairs in here. So uh, this is uh, in conjunction with Indiana's uh, Phase 5. And so uh, as elders, we've decided to add just a few more chairs, and uh, we're going to kind of see how that goes. So that's why you have a few more chairs in here. So thank you so guys so much. Again, uh, take some of those invite cards. Other than that, uh, will you come on up and share our pastoral prayer? Thanks, guys. Good morning, church. Love those amazing mugs, don't we? As we've been reminded in the prayer prompt and promptings to pray for the persecuted church, may we never take for granted this blessing of gathering together in worship, right? We've gone through one national trauma after another this year, it seems, and it seems like our sense of uh, comfort and normalcy has been jerked from under us, that the, uh, that the system has been overwhelmed by forces that are totally outside of our control. The coronavirus, the shutdown, the uh, crash of the economy and markets, the Supreme Court, and perhaps uh, all to be capped off uh, by so much chaos and ugliness in our political discourse and the coming election. But through all that, we know at least two things for sure. First. God is sovereign. 
The prophet Daniel says, God removes kings and sets up kings. R.C. Sproul said about 10 years ago, in every election, God has the final vote. That ought to be comforting to us, regardless of our politics. Regardless of who's on the Supreme Court or who's the next president, on November 4th, Jesus will still be king. So we know that God is sovereign, but we also know that Jesus is beautiful. The Puritans had a saying about prayer. They said, that prayer is most likely to pierce heaven, which first pierces one's own heart. Let's join our hearts and go to our sovereign Lord in prayer this morning. Join me as I read from this uh, Puritan prayer book, this uh, Puritan prayer about the beauty of Jesus. May this be our prayer this morning of our hearts. O majestic and sovereign God, we bow before you with one heart in the name of your beautiful son, King Jesus. In your beauty, blessed Lord, we see a fullness of grace, truth, and righteousness. It corresponds exactly to the wants of poor sinners, your blood to cleanse, your grace to comfort, your fullness to supply. In you there is everything we can want, life, light, joy, pardon, mercy, peace, happiness here, and glory hereafter. Do I not see you, my king, in your beauty, when I behold you coming with all these for me? So I must cry out with the psalmist, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. And that is not all, because when I see the king in his beauty, I see him also in his love. Yes, blessed Lord, you are so beautiful, for you have so loved poor sinners that you give yourself for them. And we know that our love for you did not come first, but your love to us came first. Your love prompted ours. Your love filled our hearts and by your spirit first prompted our minds to look toward you. That makes you lovely indeed. And now, Lord, every day's view of you increases that love and brings home your beauty more and more. The more often you stoop to visit my poor soul, the more beautiful you appear. Every appearance, every view, every glimpse of Jesus tends to make my God and King more gracious and lovely to my soul and adds fresh fervor to my love. Come then, you blessed, holy, lovely one, and ravish my spiritual senses with your beauty that my whole soul would be filled only with the love of Jesus every day. Until that day when, from seeing you here below, through your grace I come to look upon you and live forever in your presence, in the full beams of your glory, in the throne of love. O Holy Spirit, may this be the prayer, not just of our lips and our mind, but the prayer of our hearts, enraptured by your beauty. Amen. Amen. We are going to uh, introduce you to a new song this morning, um, just as a preparation for uh, what, what Pastor Mike will be preaching on. This is a new hymn uh, by the Gettys called My Worth is Not in What I Owe. My 
My worth is not in what I owe, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. My worth is not in skill or name, in win or lose, in pride or shame, but in the blood of Christ that flowed at the cross. I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in him, no other. My soul is satisfied in him alone. As summer's flowers, we fade and die. Fame, youth, and beauty hurry by. But life eternal calls to us. Boast in wealth or might, or human's wisdom's fleeting light. But I will boast in knowing Christ at the cross. I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. Trust in him, no other. My soul is satisfied in him alone. Two wonders here that I confess my worth and my unworthiness. True my power will fix my ransom day. in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him, no other. My soul is satisfied in Him alone. I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul i will trust in him no other my soul is satisfied in him alone thanks praise team those uh words are very fitting for the book of Ecclesiastes, which we've been in, and particularly this morning as we look at this topic of wealth. Ecclesiastes has a lot to say about that topic. You know, I think all Americans particularly, but I think probably everyone at some level, resonates with stories of people who started out very poor, and uh, they grew up in very humble and simple beginnings, and through hard work, or even sometimes through blind luck, they were able to, to make it really big, and, and they were able to, to kind of uh, become super wealthy. There's lots of stories like that in our culture. We have a lot of opportunity for that sort of thing. One example is Howard Schultz, former CEO of Starbucks. Grew up in a public housing project, uh, he, as he gives his story, he talks about the fact that he used to very much envy the people on the other side of the tracks, people who seemed to have lots and, and have lots of opportunities, and he always felt like his family had very little. He was able to, to go to the University of Northern Michigan on a football scholarship where he earned a degree in communications, and after graduation, he came out, he began to work at Xerox, <clears throat> but then he, he uh, uh, was 
was able to get a job as the, the one who was the CEO of, of a relatively modest uh, coffee shop. There was about 60 shops when he took over. Uh, by the time he left, there were well over 16,000 uh, Starbucks around the world, and uh, his net worth today is estimated around $4.1 billion. Another, you know, amazing success story uh, of, of the sort of rags to riches is, is uh, Oprah Winfrey, uh, another woman. She grew up uh, poor, uh, with a poor family in, in Mississippi, kind of has some, some tragic elements to her childhood, uh, but uh, when she was in high school, she had a couple of things. She was, she was very popular, very well-liked, very hard worker. Uh, she won a beauty contest. And uh, she also, won, uh, when she was in high school, she, she got a, that kind of helped her uh, get noticed and got a job at, a, at a, uh, an AM radio station in her town on the air while she was still in high school. She also won a, a public speaking contest that earned her a scholarship at the University of Tennessee. And uh, with that, then, she graduated and was able to, to get a job at a at a radio station in Chicago and eventually became her own show and eventually her own network. And today she's estimated as a net worth of two and a half billion dollars. And so, you know, we all resonate with stories like that at some level because all of us would love for that to be our story, right? I mean, who wouldn't like to see their own net worth grow considerably from wherever they started out to, 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 to have a lot of money? All of us at some level would love to, to have a lot of money. And um, Solomon, in, in, in his book that he's written here of Ecclesiastes, he, he himself kind of talks about his own pursuit of that. That among other elements of life that he pursued, he pursued great wealth. He came into great wealth as the king in Jerusalem. It gave him great opportunity. And he, probably more than any of the other Israelite kings, had access to amazing wealth, and he talks about pursuing that as an opportunity to find real meaning in life. Maybe real meaning, maybe real significance is found in accumulating great wealth and all the things this world has to offer. But like the other elements of life that he pursues and he talks about, it, it comes up empty. There's an essence in which money didn't really satisfy. And so I want us to, to look into this topic uh, here in Ecclesiastes this morning. We've been in this series, Searching for Meaning in a World that Seems Empty. And we, we looked a couple weeks ago at Ecclesiastes chapter 2, and in verses 7 and 8 here, Solomon kind of, in, in chapter 2, he, he just talks about his various pursuits and how he accumulated a lot of different sorts of things and uh, among those things are wealth and material things. He says in verses 7 and 8, he says, I bought male and female slaves. I had slaves who were born into my home. I also had great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. In fact, you know, again, if, if you're looking for something to, to read that kind of goes along with the message in your devotions this week or something. First Kings, the first several chapters of First Kings tells us a lot about Solomon and all that he had, and, and it describes a lot, of, uh, a lot of elements, both of his wisdom, his wealth, his power, his possessions, all these different things. And, and in, in chapter 10, verses 14 and 15, we get this little snippet into how legendary his wealth was. It says in, in this, those couple of verses, every year Solomon brought in 25 tons of gold just in foreign taxes. And it specifically says this doesn't include kind of his business ventures and, and, and other forms of, of accumulating wealth. Just his taxation on foreign nations brought in about 25 tons, 50,000 pounds of gold every year. You bring that, just for kick's sake, you kind of bring that into our economy today and the, the, the value of gold today. What would 50,000 pounds of gold be worth today? It's something like $9 billion. So, so again, you can't quite make those, those comparisons exactly, but just to give us sort of a general idea, I mean, this guy's bringing in $9 billion every year just from foreign taxes, not counting business adventures or, or other means of income. This guy was extremely wealthy. 
But what's he say in verse 11 of chapter 2? He says, Then I considered all that my hands had done, and the toil that I had expended in doing it, and behold, all of it was vanity, and, and striving after the wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. Why was wealth and this pursuit of wealth such an empty pursuit? Well, I want to look at two things this morning, and and really this is part one because we're only going to kind of begin to look into the second half of of this, and then next week uh, we're going to kind of fully look at that topic. But I want to begin by just looking at the common incentives for money. Because I said at the beginning that all of us at some level would like to have more money. All of us wish at some level, again, that that we were wealthy, some more than others, or that we were wealthier. But that's not to say that everybody has the same reasons for desiring money. Money means different things to different people. There are various incentives why people would love to be wealthy. And again, probably more than any other culture throughout history, the American culture, this is true of. Uh, one, One quote that I read this week uh, in, a, in a book that I was reading on this topic, said, money has grown so dominant in our culture that it's difficult for us to stand far enough back to get a perspective. No matter what we may say, many of us live as if the pursuit of wealth is the real goal of life. The real reason I'm here, the real reason I get up in the morning and go somewhere, the real reason why I go to college and study, the real reason why I married the person I did, or the real reason I took the career that I did, whatever, you fill in the blanks. For many people, money plays a big role in in, in all of the major decisions that we make as Americans. And so what are the different reasons, and there may be more than this, but there's at least five different reasons as I was just thinking about this topic this week as to why we desire money. The first is that money equals pleasure. Money equals pleasure. You know, we, we've often heard it said money can't buy happiness, and, and that is certainly true, but money can buy pleasure. Money is the source of things that, that bring, you know, initial immediate gratification, whether it's uh, you know, concert tickets, a, a nice meal out at a restaurant, a fun vacation with the family, admission to an amusement park, a fast car. I mean, there's lots of things that are pleasurable in this life that it requires money to have. In fact, Solomon makes that point in, in sort of a, a passing proverb here in Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 19. It says, bread is made for laughter and wine gladdens life and money answers everything. Again, it's, some, it's kind of unclear. In fact, it's even a little bit unclear the, the, if that's the right way to translate that final phrase, money answers everything. But the, the, the sense in context seems to be he's talking about you know, pleasure and, and he sort of summarizes pleasure through the, 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 the words bread and wine. You know, they, they provide laughter and gladness. And in order to get those things, you need money. Money is sort of the answer to get those things. It's sort of the avenue, the pathway to get the things that make us happy. So for many, money equals pleasure. They, we would like more money because there's more things that would bring us pleasure that we could do that we presently can't do. For others, money equals security. You know, greed really does have many different faces to it. For some, greed reveals itself by sort of extravagant living, living beyond our means, racking up the credit cards, buying things I don't need, but they're kind of showy or they're fun. But for others, greed is, I want to have a lot of it so that I can store it away so that I feel really secure in life, so that I don't have to be afraid, so that I don't have fears of what might happen. If if there's an economic downturn, I'll be fine. My family will be fine. And on the surface, that feels really wise, and that seems really smart. It doesn't feel greedy, and and certainly there's a level of wisdom. Even the Proverbs would would affirm a level of wisdom behind saving and not, you know, being extravagant. But the truth is, for many, when we say that I live by faith or that I trust God or that my dependence is on Him, if we're really honest, it's just not true. We don't need to trust God. We've got enough money for the things in life that we need. Why would I need to pray for X or Y or for my daily bread each day? I got enough to go and buy it. I've got a secure job that even, even if something happened to this, I can make more. And, and so 
our real heart attitude for some, that is the greed becomes, I want to have as much as possible, and I even take um, joy or pride in the fact that I live really frugally. Because that means that living at this level with this much saved up, I'm really safe. I am really secure, whatever might happen to me. Again, Ecclesiastes even kind of hints at this uh, value of money for many as well. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 12 says, For the protection of wisdom is like the protection of money. The advantage of knowledge is that wisdom preserves the life of him who has it. Again, he's basically saying, in the same way that money is security, that money is protection, that having money protects you from unforeseen issues, he, he likens wisdom to it. But the point is he acknowledges there's a sense of security that can be pulled from having money. So for some, that's why they want more money, to be more secure. For others, money equals power. We, we see this maybe most obviously in the political realm where people who have a lot of money are typically able to buy policies, right? They're able to donate to particular candidates. That gives them an ear. You know, that money doesn't just, they don't just give it for nothing. It kind of comes with some some things attached, some strings attached to it, and so that they, they give money to certain candidates so that they can sit down with that candidate and say, you know, you want re-election, you want me to give to your campaign, here's some policies I want to see get put into place. And if you won't do it, I'll talk to your opponent and see if he'll do it. And so, you know, money in the political spectrum, you know, I could mention some names of some big ticket donors, big dollar donors, probably in both parties, where you know, they give not just because they're nice people, it's because they, they want their policies to get enacted. And so money is power. But, you know, just bringing it down to our level, uh, you know, the idea of money is power. If you have money in life, you're able to do things. You're able to get things done. You know, it's frustrating when the car breaks down and you don't have enough money to fix the car. And then if you can't fix the car, well, then you can't get to work possibly, and so you can't earn more money, and so it kind of spirals. It's, you know, a person who has the amount of money to afford a, a vehicle that runs well is also a person who has the power to apply for a job across town, uh, to uh, do other things that, that having that car affords them, and so money is power for some, and so for some it's not so much that they want a lot of neat things, it's that they want to have the ability to do things when they, when they arise. They want to have the power to, to do things in life. Fourthly, money equals status. For some, money isn't so much about the, the pleasure that they get from having a lot of things or having nice things versus modest things. It's the sense of status. It's how it makes them feel about themselves. It's how they imagine, and it's true probably, how other people will look at them. Driving this car rather than this car, other people see me and they say, now there's a success. When people see me going home to my house versus my neighbor's much more modest home, people say he's more important than him. And so for some, it's the status. It's the idea that net worth oftentimes gets equated with felt worth. People tend to look at how much money I have or how much money other people have, and there's this equation of, of success. You are a success in life if you have a lot of money, particularly if you earned it yourself. If you were smart enough to figure out how to earn it, if you worked hard enough and long enough hours to accumulate it, if you were wise enough not to blow it, particularly it's sort of the symbol of success. And so there's status that, that goes with wealth. And so for some, it's more the sense of, of, of their, how they feel about themselves. They feel so much better about themselves if they have money. And they believe others feel about them similarly. And so money provides status. And then fifthly, money equals friends. And for some, there's sort of just that sense of the, the friends and the relationships that open up, the doors to relationships that open up when you have resources. Proverbs talks about this quite a bit. Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 4, wealth brings many new friends, but a poor man is deserted by his friends. A couple verses later, many seek the favor of a generous man, and everyone is a friend to a man who gives gifts. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 20, the poor is disliked even by his neighbor, but the rich has many friends. 
There's clearly the sense that if you have money and you use it in any sort of a way to be generous toward others, you can accumulate friends. And for some, they love the ability to, to be generous, not because they just have a generous heart, but because they want people to like them. And there's this drive to be liked and to have relationships and friendships. And so, and, and so money for them means an avenue, a doorway into, into popularity or fame or, or just being liked. I mean, just in a general sense, again, you can see how people that have money have a lot more opportunities to pursue friendships and relationships. You know, if you have the money to go out to eat, you can go out to eat with friends. If not, you're in that awkward place where people are going out and you kind of have to decline because well, I'm not going to mooch off of them, but can't even, you know, I, I just, my budget's that tight. Or, you know, you can afford the concert tickets to go out with the friends to the concert or, or whatever it is. But somebody who can't has to be really careful. They have to say no to, to those kinds of opportunities. And you say no enough and people stop asking you. They ask others. If you've got a nice home and it's a great place to entertain, you can have people over to your house. I mean, even just, in, you know, kids in high school. You know, the, the, the kid who's got a really, his parents have a really nice place, they got the pull out back, they've got a nice gaming system, you know, what, what friends don't want to come to his place and hang out, as opposed to the guy that's got very little material things, it's kind of harder to say, hey, you want to come to my house and spend the weekend? So, again, money equals friends, at least at a superficial level, and for some, that's really what they desire, they wish they had more money because it would help them develop more relationships. And so there's a lot of incentives, there's a lot of common incentives why, why we desire money. But I think money is a universal desire. There's very few people, I don't know you're going to find very many people, who at some level, if they had the opportunity, wouldn't say, yeah, I'd like to have more. But in light of that, Solomon in Ecclesiastes gives some critical instructions about money. He talks quite a bit. He, he repeats himself on certain aspects of wisely viewing money in light of the fact that if you pursue money as the end goal of life, if money becomes the sort of your primary thing that, that this is what you want out of life, it will leave you empty. It is vanity. It's chasing after the wind. And so in light of that, he gives some, some critical instructions. And again, we're just going to look at the first of them this week and then next week We'll look at a few others of those. But the first bit of, of instruction that he gives is, is pretty simple. It's this. It's money doesn't last. Money doesn't last. In fact, if you haven't turned anywhere yet, turn, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. I'll probably be most in this chapter, although we'll, I'll be looking around a little bit. But uh, if you're going to turn somewhere, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. <clears throat> He says this, he says, There is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. What and what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? He makes the point here that wealth is uncertain. Wealth is uncertain. We've all heard the, the phrase, here today, gone tomorrow. That's kind of what he's saying here. He says, you know, wealth, wealth is un uncertain. You're one bad venture or one bad investment away from losing it. It's kind of... What he references here in verse 14, he says, you know, those riches were lost in a bad venture. He talks about the owner who kept them to his own hurt. He kept them and he invested them in the wrong thing and he lost them all to the point that he had nothing left to give his son uh, uh, as, a, as an inheritance. Randy, as he was praying, referenced, you know, the, the, this year and all that's happened. But I mean, a, a, among other things, this year has revealed the uncertainty of wealth. I mean, how many people thought they had a, a business that was thriving, that was um, predictably going to be around for a while? They were kind of looking at profits, and they were predicting out, and now they're out of business. COVID shutdowns took their toll, and they had to close up shop. 
or employees who had a, a, a job that, that was secure. They didn't worry. Other people had to worry, and they were so thankful their job was a secure job. And similarly, they're out of a job now. Totally unforeseen layoffs. And they haven't been able to find another one similar to it. Or others who haven't lost their job, but they had a pretty safe income, but they had to take a percent reduction in order to keep their job, and it's way less than it was, and now their budget's really tight. Like No one predicted that just a year ago. Everyone was talking about how great the economy was, and it's just headed upwards. You think back to 2008, 2009, and there were a lot of things that happened in those years, likewise, that sort of took everybody by surprise. You had the the, uh, in 2008, you had the Bernie Madoff scandal and some uber-wealthy people who had invested with him, and they were set for life. I mean, they had beautiful houses, and, and, and literally some of them were billionaires, and they discovered in one day when the scandal came to light that they were actually broke, that they actually owed more, they had more in debt than they actually had in, in real money, and there was nothing they could do about it. Numerous, very wealthy people committed suicide in the, in the, the course of, of a week or two because to them, life was over. They had lived their lives with money as the end goal, and all of a sudden, the uncertainty of holding on to that wealth became very clear, and in their minds, unfortunately, they had nothing else to live for. How sad. That same year, you had a stock market crash in 2009, a housing market that more or less, was more or less a housing market crash, and uh, some people who had really nice houses in certain parts of the, the country, suddenly they were worth very little. I remember my dad was beginning to look for a warm climate to purchase a home in, and he was looking at a lot of places in, in um, Florida where, where it had some really nice houses, and they were just super cheap because no one wanted them. No one was, was buying them. They weren't worth at all what they had you know, been worth uh, based on a, a real estate bubble that had uh, been, been in place for years. And, and so people that had invested in that or that was their home and that was their primary investment lost a lot of it. There's just this principle that wealth is uncertain. And so you know, just looking back at the why some people love wealth because of the security it brings to, to, to recognize that that security isn't true security. And to some degree, people who, who have it know it. They realize, okay, now I've, now I've got this standard of living, but what do I have to do to keep it? Now I've got to work really, really hard to try to keep it, and, and what if I lose it? Now I've got to protect it. I've got to make sure no one steals it. I've got to make sure that... And, and so there's just sort of this anxiety that goes along with having a lot because you have to figure out how to keep it and maintain it because it's not a guarantee that you're going to keep it and maintain it. And so it doesn't really provide you the security that you think it does. There's sort of an emptiness behind that security. It's part of the implications of Ecclesiastes. But not only is wealth uncertain, but secondly, death is certain. Even if you manage, even if you figure out how to get that wealth and to keep it throughout your life, there's coming a day you're going to die, and then we're also all familiar with the phrase, you can't take it with you. And beyond that, you can't even control how people behind you that you leave it to use it. Not only do you lose the wealth, you kind of lose the ability to control and dictate how that wealth is used. That's what he says here in Ecclesiastes 5, verses 15 and 16. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. He didn't bring anything into this world. He's not going to get to take any of it back with him. When he leaves this world, he leaves it all behind. This also, he says, is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who toils for the wind. In other words, what eternal gain is there? What eternal gain is there if, if when I die, I don't take any of it with me as I go into wherever I go to, into eternity, if I can't take any of it with me, then he says there's not really any gain to, to getting it. And this is a big reason in Ecclesiastes, again, this is one of those repeated themes, this is a big reason why he talks about life being hevel, vanity, meaningless, empty, however you understand or try to interpret that word. Life is empty because of death. 
Death is sort of the big equalizer. All the things that we could acquire and accumulate and live for, when we die, then what happens to all of it? Because of death, life is Havel. Elsewhere, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 18 and 19, he says, I hated all of my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool, yet he will be the master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. I'm the one that worked hard. I'm the one that figured out how to get this business up and going. I'm the one that, and then this guy comes along and he just steps right in where I left off. And he's got everything that I had to work really hard for. He might even be a fool and he steps in as a fool and he's got everything I had. Well, that doesn't seem fair. That doesn't seem right. And so this drives us naturally to the question of, well, what does happen after death? If I can't take my wealth with me, then, then what does happen after death? And while Ecclesiastes doesn't, by any stretch, give us a clear teaching or doctrine of heaven and hell, some even think that he totally doesn't know. There's, there's a reference to that, that some imply uh, from what he says here about, you know, whether the beasts of man, or whether the spirit of a man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes down, nobody knows, that he's basically saying we don't know what happens, but I don't think that's really what he's getting at there, because he does make it clear that after death is judgment. He seems to have a very clear sense, he, he mentions it at least three different times, that after death we will give an account and we will be judged by God. He has a sense that there is eternal life and existence after this, and it is an existence that is marked by standing in judgment. Just one example is Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 14. He says, for God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. There's nothing we're going to hide from him on that day. He's not going to be taken by surprise at something, or you're not going to kind of get something by him. And so in, in light of the fact that wealth is uncertain and death is certain, then, then this leads to the implication that we should invest it wisely while you can. While you have it here in this life, while it's yours to manage, invest it wisely. This is also a theme that, that flows up in Ecclesiastes a few different times. And I've summarized it into two principles. The first is the principle of stewardship. Be careful how you view it. Be careful how you view your money. Again, here in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, uh, just a few verses later, verses 18 and 19, he says, Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possession and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. We, we talked about this last week, and, and again, because these, these principles kind of overlap, the principle of pleasure, the principle of money, and, and how to view them properly, but viewing money properly begins by viewing it as God's gift to me. If I am wealthy, it's not because I earned it and I deserved it and I'm such a great guy. It's because God was generous to me. It was his gift to me. And it's, it's even interesting that he talks about not only the fact that God gives wealth to some, but even those some that have it, only some of them are given the ability to enjoy it, he mentions. The ability for me to enjoy it, the pleasure that I get from it, is also a gift from God. And so be, it begins with having a proper view of, of this money to begin with. Whose money is this? You know, it's really on loan to me from God. I don't get to take it with me when I'm done with this world. It's kind of on loan to me from Him. It's a gift from Him to me while I'm here on earth, and then I go to be judged by Him, and I have to leave it all behind, and someone else has it. And He gives it to somebody else, in other words. It's on loan to me. Kyle Eidelman has written the book Gods at War, it talks about idolatry of various sorts, and there's a lot of similar themes between sort of the, the book of Ecclesiastes and, and, and Solomon's teaching about the sorts of things we tend to give our lives to, the sorts of things we tend to give ourselves to, and the, the theme of idolatry, the, the sorts of things we tend to worship in life. But he talks in one of his chapters about money as an idol, money as something that, that too many of us try to live for, and he, he shared the illustration of this, the 2009 stock market crash when uh, 
Uh, his father, who was 61 at the time, uh, had never been much of a, of a money maker. He, he didn't ever earn a big salary, but he was very wise with his money. He was always very careful to, to save. And, um, and when this happened, he asked his dad, hey, you know, how are you and mom doing? How, you know, this, this whole stock market thing, how's that impacted your plans to retire? And his dad said, well, we lost about 40% of our savings in our retirement in this. And he said, well, how are you guys doing losing so much of your money at once? And he said his dad smiled at him without even thinking too much and said, well, it, it never really was ours to begin with, now was it? And he went on to quote from Philippians 4.19, which said, my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And he said, what a, what a proper perspective on wealth. My security was never in all of this. My security is in God. And by the way, not, this wasn't all mine to begin with. Imagine how that would change our thought processes in general if we learned and we disciplined ourselves to view all that we have as really belonging to God. I mean, just think about how you think differently. If, if you own your own house, uh, maybe you are blessed enough and you own a vacation home somewhere and you travel down there at times, versus somebody wealthy comes to you and they say, hey, I want to bless you. I, I, want, I want to send, and you're dirt poor maybe, I want to, I want to send you down to a, 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 a um, vacation spot that I have down in, in Maui or someplace, and I want, I want you to live there for two weeks. Like your mindset when you're there in that place on somebody else's dime and you realize this is their bed, this is, you know, this is their money that I'm buying food with, and this is, you know, maybe they leave you a credit card and they say, here, you, 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 you enjoy the, the two weeks. You know, it totally changes how you use that. You're always stopping and saying, would they think this is extravagant? Would, would they think this kind of fits with what they meant when they said enjoy the week? Would, 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 would this be... I mean, imagine if, if your vehicle, if you didn't own a vehicle because you couldn't afford one and somebody else who was wealthy said, hey, I've got an extra vehicle. I just want you to borrow it for as long as you need it for now. I'll, I'll get it later, but you use it. You know, when, when somebody comes up to you and says, hey, uh, would I, could I use your car to run someplace? Uh, I need to, to take a trip. Your thought process is totally different. You know, the first, if it was your car, you might be thinking, well, do I really want them using this car? Are they going to take care of it? Like, what are they going to do? If it's somebody else's car, your thought is, would that person want me to loan this to them? I mean, imagine if, if that person who loaned you that car, if their own son came to you and said, I really need to use a vehicle. Can I use that vehicle? It's like, well, hey, it's your dad's vehicle. Yeah, go for it. Like, your thought process is totally different. And if we viewed our things and our money as God's, and God's son or daughter comes to us and says, I, I really need help, like, our thought process is totally different. It's not a matter of, well, am I feeling generous today? It's a matter of, well, this is his money, and this is his son or daughter. I wonder, what he, I wonder if he would think that this is wise for me to give this to them. And how much would he want me of, to give of his money to them? And so, th this first principle of using it wisely while we have it is this principle of stewardship. Be careful how we view it. It's not mine, it's, it's his it's on loan. I don't get to take it with me. So I'd better invest it while I'm here. I'm just going to leave it behind and lose it and give it to people who may not invest it wisely. So maybe I should invest it wisely while it's been entrusted to me. But then that leads naturally to the second principle, and that's the principle of generosity. Be careful how you use it. This, this principle of generosity comes up a couple different places here in Ecclesiastes. We, we saw a glimpse of it in, in verse 13 of chapter 5 that we already read where he says, There's a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt. The implication is this guy held on to it tightly. He didn't want to let it go. He wanted to make sure he got to keep it and enjoy it. And then in the end, he lost it anyways. It's like, how tragic was that? Earlier in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 is kind of an interesting poem. Sometimes you hear it at funerals because it really is a poem that, that talks about the reality of death. Because, de because of death, it, it sort of balances out the world and how we view the world, that there's a time for, for everything. And, and so, you know, he begins by saying, <clears throat> for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. And then everything after it in some way 
or another kind of flows with things associated with new birth and, and new beginnings and new things versus things that kind of come to the end and, and things that, you know, whether it's an end of a relationship versus the beginning of a relationship or, or within that you have this element of, of what I do with things. And so in, verses, in verse 6 he says there is a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away. The implication is that there's certain times of life where you're, you're seeking and buying. You're getting new things. You're looking for new things. You're pursuing things, and you're accumulating things, but there's also times to let go of things. There's, there's appropriate times in life to look and say, you know, this, this is kind of a time to downsize. This is a time to let go of things, to lose them. And likewise, there's a time to keep things and hold on to them versus a time to cast away. There's this, this idea of being generous and giving and it's especially in light of this reality of death, you know, I was thinking of this principle because my, my grandparents were getting up in age and they've both got um, somewhat obvious health issues and they, they recently moved into a new home. And uh, when they moved, you know, they had to go through the process of packing and going through all their stuff. And I had said to my mom who was helping, I was like, well, this is a great opportunity for them to figure out a whole bunch of stuff they want to get rid of because in 10 years from now, if they're still here, uh, you know, they don't want to have to do it then. And, uh, and she had said, ah, we have, her and her siblings, we have tried to tell them, get rid of stuff. Time to get rid of stuff. But, you know, they just didn't want to. So they packed it all up, and it's kind of in boxes in their basement, which they will probably never go through. And so, again, the, the point of this is, is that, you know, as, as you look at the fact that, you know, I'm coming to the second part of life here where I'm kind of on the way down, and I'm anticipating that, that my life on this earth is about to come to an end. Embrace the idea of casting away and giving. You know, this is a great opportunity for generosity. It's a great opportunity to invest the things that I have and find people who need them or sell them and use the money to, to invest in other people. I, I saw a news story this week, and I'm, I don't imagine this man's a Christian or that he's doing it for Christian reasons, but it was a story about a billionaire who, who, you know, his first goal in life was to become super rich. He made that goal, and I assume he realized that there was something sort of missing, that there was sort of an emptiness of that goal. And so he, he developed a new goal. I want to give it all away before I die. And just recently, he, he ba basically ac uh, accomplished that goal. He gave all of it away. Today, he, he lives with his wife in a very modest two-bedroom apartment because he gave most of it away. And, and he found joy and pleasure in that stage of life, being able to invest all of this stuff in, in various needs and, and important causes. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, he says, Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Give a portion to seven or even to eight, for you know not what disaster may happen on the earth. You can't predict what's going to happen if you just try to hold on to it all and, and just kind of protect it all. So invest it now. Give it away. The context here is, is probably talking about commerce. He's not talking about, I, I remember forever I'd hear this, cast your bread upon the water, and I would have this imagery of feeding the ducks, you know, <laughs> taking bread and throwing it on the water to the ducks. And I remember thinking, what in the world is cast your bread on the water? Well, bread here probably is a reference to the grains, and, and casting it on the water means loading it up on ships and sending it in commerce. But, you know, that was a risky thing. To take all of this grain and put it on a ship, what if that ship sinks? All that you could lose. But the point of it is, yeah, there's risk in that, but the reward makes it worth it. And then he goes on to say, diversify your risk. Give it to seven or eight. Don't just put it all in one ship. You know, spread out that risk, but you need to send it out if you're going to bring anything back. In verse 4, he talks about this idea of risk. He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds then will not reap. Yeah, if you're like, well, it's not a good time to sow seed because, look, it's kind of windy. Yeah, that's true. So if you just never sow seeds because there's always a reason why it's not the perfect time, you're never going to reap. Yeah, some of what you sow isn't going to become anything. Some of what you sow isn't going to grow, but some will. And, and many commentators recognize, yeah, this is talking about commerce, but it's poetic, and it's probably really getting at the heart of generosity. In fact, the message translation narrows in on this in their paraphrase of it, and they, they, they paraphrase these verses this way. Be generous. Invest in acts of charity. Charity yields high returns. Don't hoard your goods. Spread them around. Be a blessing to others. This could be your last night. 
You don't know how much time we have. When that time comes, we're going to have to leave it to somebody else, so why don't we invest it now? That's, again, a theme in Ecclesiastes. Well, I'm running out of time here, and I, and I want to end with this. Uh, the praise team actually read this verse earlier, but 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 through 19, really summarizes well these principles. And I'm, I'm just going to leave you at this. It says, As for the rich in this present age, charge them or instruct them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good and to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves and a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold on that which is truly life. Have you developed a perspective on money that has enabled you to take a hold of that which is truly life? Solomon encourages us to figure that out now and to do that as we view money. I'm going to ask the praise team to come up and close us in a final song. Pastor Mike, would you please stand with me as we sing our final closing hymn today, It Is Well With My Soul.
Yeah.